Hey everybody, welcome to our online service this week. My name's Andy and I have the privilege of overseeing our online campus. During my Bible study earlier this week, I was reading Matthew 7. In verses 24 to 27, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. After reading this, it really struck me about just how much content is available online and how easy it is to just consume it without ever putting anything into practice. I never want what we're doing here at Bridgepoint to just be more digital noise. We shouldn't attend every week just to be entertained. The goal should be to connect and grow together. If we actually put into practice what we're hearing each week, Jesus says that we'll be building our lives on a firm foundation, strong enough to withstand what life throws at us. So that's my prayer for each of you today. I pray that as we continue to learn more about God's grace and freedom, we would decide now that this is the time to lean in for all that God is to teach us. So let's decide today to put into practice what we're learning. Enjoy the service, everyone. Well, good morning, church. Let's stand and worship together. There is a sound it's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praise as he hears faith. Soon there's a sound, come on. There is a sound. Sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears.
How are we doing this morning? We good? It's good to see you. All right, we got some caffeine. You got some coffee on your way in, maybe a donut or two. I like it. Keep the energy coming. Want you to feel welcome in this place, whether you're joining us online or here with us at our Tyrone campus. If it's your first time, we're especially glad that you're here. Uh, we feel privileged that you would uh, spend this hour, this time with us and encourage you after the service to come see us in the atrium. We have a bag for you with information about what God is doing in and through Bridgepoint church. We would love for you to participate because God has us on the move and there's some exciting stuff taking place here at Bridgepoint Church. Uh, also, whether you're a first time guest, or you've been around for a while, we have something coming up called Starting Point. Gabe's going to give you some of those details, but want to invite you to Starting Point. Yeah, so if you are new to Bridgepoint Church, Starting Point is a great place to learn more about who we are and how we operate. Or if you find yourself, hey, I've been a part of Bridgepoint for a while and I'm looking to take a next step in the membership process, Starting Point is that next step of that process. It's just a really great way to learn more about Bridgepoint Church. So I hope you will sign up for that. That's happening November 16th, Wednesday, November 16th here at our Tyrone campus. Yeah, but again, so glad that you are with us. And, and listen, whether you've been to church before, whether it's Bridgepoint or another church, or you have never stepped foot into a church building in your life, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome. And it doesn't matter what the past has looked like. It doesn't matter what this past week has looked like or last night or even the hour or the drive on your way here. We trust that God has you here for a reason and that God's gonna show up in a powerful way and has a message for us as a community and a message for us individually. So so listen, during, during the message, when, when you hear something that God is just speaking to you through Tyler's message, which is fire, by the way, feel free to shout out an amen. As we worship, feel free to sit down and reflect on what God's doing in your life or to put your hands high and to worship big. However you worship, whatever it looks like, know that you are welcome in this place and you're welcome to receive whatever God has for you in the way that is best for you. So glad you're here. But seeing that we're not uh, here alone, that we are here in the community, let's take just a minute, turn to somebody around you, wave from afar, say what's up, introduce yourself as we continue. Love it. So church, we're going to continue to worship and we're going to enter into, again, a time of worship together. And just something quickly that was on my heart as I was driving to church this morning, I was praying and asking for God to be present, to be moving and to be in this space and to be in this room. And in that moment, I realized something that God promises us in his word, in Deuteronomy, that he will never leave us or forsake us. And so I think the prayer that I'm challenged with is not whether or not God would you be present because he is, but the prayer to be, would I be made more aware of his presence? And so in this time of worship, that's what we're doing. We are making ourselves more aware of God's presence because he is already here. So friends, welcome this morning and let's continue to worship together. All right, sing this out with me, come on. I am weary from the waves crashing Father, tell me everything's alright. 
pray with me. God, we celebrate our victory in you this morning. Your name is powerful. Your words can move mountains, God. And I just, I pray for anyone that is struggling this morning, that, that you, you give us a breakthrough, God. Speak to us and, and help us feel your presence this morning, God. Give us comfort and peace in knowing that we can find our hope in you, our freedom in you, God. Thank you for your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for singing. You can have a seat.
Many times today, I will cross over a threshold. I hope I will catch a few of those times. I need to remember that my life is, in fact, a continuous series of thresholds. From one moment to the next. From one thought to the next. From one action to the next. Help me appreciate how awesome this is. How many are the chances to really be alive? Help me cross into the present moment, into the wonder, into your grace, the now place, where we all are unfolding moment by moment. All right, happy Sunday, Bridgepoint on every campus. How are we doing? Everybody feeling good? Awesome. Welcome in, everybody. Welcome to week four of our series called Grace the Now Place. We're working through the book of Galatians, preaching through it to see what Paul, when he originally wrote this book almost 2,000 years ago to churches in the region of Galatia, what his writings as recorded in Scripture, we know it as the book of Galatians, might mean for us today. So if you missed any of this series, go back, catch ups on YouTube or through the Bridgepoint app. Lots of really, really powerful truths that we've been unpacking. And I actually think today, uh, today was probably my favorite message of all of them. So I'm really, really pumped for today to, to process with you, to see what scripture might mean for us together. Uh, let me start with a question. And I hope it's a question that at least gets you thinking a little bit. Resist the temptation to initially respond to it, okay? Nobody needs to say anything out loud anyway. But let me ask you this question and, and get your opinion on it as we kick off today's message. How do I know? How do you know? How do we know? How do I know if I'm living in the grace and freedom of Jesus? How do I know if I'm living in the grace and freedom of Jesus? Because I think for a lot of us, many well-intended followers are often trying to have some kind of benchmark or measurement to say, uh, well, yeah, I'm doing I'm doing better than that guy, but not as good as her. So I'm kind of right in the middle. Or thank God that I'm not like she is, but uh, got a ways to go before I'm like him. But what's, what's that benchmark to know how good of a job we're doing? But I also recognize that that question for a lot of people, both followers of Jesus and those of you that might be walking in or tuning in with a level of skepticism of the things of faith, to be like, what do you mean the freedom of Jesus? Because honestly, that kind of stands in contrast to the rap Christianity often gets in our popular culture because culture would actually say culture people are free, followers of Jesus are anything but. So what does it mean freedom of Jesus, the grace and freedom of Jesus when we live in a world, in a country, and certainly an area that we would say, well, we are free. What do you mean I'm not free? Because that's the initial temptation. Anytime I pose a question like that, it's for many of us to be like, okay, I mean, interesting question, but I think I am free. So who is right? I mean, Paul's gonna talk specifically about freedom today and in chapter five is what we're gonna look like. The themes in chapter four are very similar to three and five. So we're gonna jump to chapter five of Galatians. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Otherwise, I'll put it on the screen. But when Paul talks about freedom, like I... I am free. I live free. I do what I want. I, I, I live my life. I do my own thing. So who, who is really free? Is it the freedom we see in culture around us? Or is it the freedom that Paul's describing that it could only come through Jesus? And how do you know which one's right or who's really got it or who doesn't? And that's the part that I want to hang on to today as we dive into what Paul had to say. I'd love for you to keep this in mind as we work through it. How do I know? How do you know? How do we know? How do I know if I'm living in the grace and freedom of Jesus? Paul's beginning, gonna begin to wrap up his letter today. And if, if you've been around, just really quickly, you know Paul was writing this letter to a church in the region of Galatia because they were struggling with living out faith in Jesus. They had discovered the freedom of Jesus, but some well-intended Jews were also coming to the, into the area saying, yeah, trust Jesus, but if you really want freedom, if you really wanna know grace, if you really want your life changed, you need to trust in Jesus and follow the rules of law, the Jewish law, as they called it. 
And what was happening is the moment you begin to try to uh, introduce any kind of measuring stick, any kind of performance-based, like living up to rules-based religiosity into the freedom of relationship that Jesus came to introduce, you end up either producing more religiosity, which was never the point, or you create a giant mess. And that's what Paul was kind of rebelling against in this letter. Let me, let me let you hear directly from him and not just me as Paul kicks off chapter five in the letter to the churches of Galatia that we know as the biblical book of Galatians. Here's what Paul said. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Man, that, that just feels good coming off a pastor's tongue. Let me live there for a minute. It's for freedom that Jesus has set us free. I hope we never get lost on this. Jesus didn't do all of these things to enter in, uh, to issue in a new religion. Jesus didn't live a life that taught us what a life of love looked like. He didn't die a death that people who are broken by sin deserve to die. And he certainly didn't rise from the grave to produce or issue in a new religion. Jesus did that so that you and I might know what freedom really looks like. It's, it's for freedom that Jesus has set you free. It's so that you and I could know freedom. It's so that in the grace of Jesus, in his unmerited favor, in that deep breath of the human soul, in our spirits, that we could be like, and know freedom by God's grace. The fact that God would look at us as broken, sinful people, imperfect to our core, love us enough, and show us enough grace to die in our place, rise from the grave, and offer us a life of freedom of becoming every ounce of who he made us to be. And Paul says it's for freedom we've been set free. It's hard for me to not want to channel my inner Mel Gibson and be like, for freedom! Because I think that's what Paul was getting at, even though he was 2,000 years ahead of Mel on this one. But it's for freedom. It's for freedom, for freedom. So are you really free? Of course I am. Of course I'm free. Of course I am. Of course I'm free. I live in the United States of America, one of the greatest countries on planet Earth. Of course I'm free. I do what I want. I live how I want. I often don't even have to think about involving anybody else in my decisions. Of course I'm free. Of course you are. But what if we're not? Let's track together and see what Paul has to say, because I think there's a really important thought that we often miss in a conversation about freedom that Paul wants to hit on. Here's what I mean. Uh, it says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. In other words, Paul said, stand firm, therefore. Stand firm. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Well, Tyler, no problem. I'm free. <laughs> I'm not gonna go back to slavery. I am free. I live in freedom. I wonder why Paul would be so intentional to remind early followers of Jesus, you are free, so don't go back. Stand firm in that freedom. Live in that freedom. Get to know that freedom better. Make sure you don't miss out on that freedom. But above everything else, don't go submit yourself to something that's going to chain you up again. Well, why would Paul need to see that if you and I were busy saying, oh, I am free? But are we? Are we? Have you ever felt the, the sting and the freedom to say, you know what, this relationship isn't good for me, so I'm gonna leave it trusting that God has better. This financial burden isn't best for me, so I'm coming out of it to trust God for that too. God's calling me into something new, so I'm gonna walk away to, from my lucrative career to trust in the freedom that he provides. God wants me to become something that I'm not yet, so I'm gonna believe him and follow him until I find it. I don't need to get stuck on a person, on a substance, on a thing, on a place, on an expectation or a status symbol of my life to dictate my freedom because I really am free. Are we, though? Because what I find as a pastor, at least in my own journey, and often I think for many of ours, is we love the idea and concept of freedom. But what we often do is go back to the very things that Jesus died to set us free from that relationship that we knew we ought not be in, those substances that we promised we had control over, that financial burden that we know wasn't the wise move for us, the positioning and the posture where people didn't value our humanity or value the work that we did. 
the expectations that other placed on us, or for many of us, the shame and condemnation we feel from our past that we so easily allow to guide and dictate our present. And Paul's saying, guys, remember, it's for freedom that Jesus died to set you free. So stand firm in it. Don't go back to old ways. Don't go back to old patterns. Don't go back to old sins, relationships, things, places, expectations. Don't go back there because you were made to know the freedom that Jesus died to set you free to experience. Paul's going to go on to unpack that. But I also acknowledge that how Paul's going to do that is he's going to contrast freedom that Jesus intended for us with many people that were going back to the law. And remember, if you've been around for any of this series, one of the chief issues that the church in Galatia was facing was uh, well-intended Jews were coming, were coming into the picture saying, yes, follow Jesus, but you need to be circumcised, the outward, uh, the outward expression of the faith at the time that you were a Jesus follower. So I also want to confess to you that we're about to talk about circumcision again. Yes, I recognize this is three out of the past four weeks that I've talked about circumcision with you, and I don't want you to think that I enjoy it any more than you do, okay? <laughs> In fact, I'd love to curtail any thought of becoming the, the Pinellas County preacher that loves to talk about circumcision. That's not what I'm aiming at, all right? It doesn't make for a fun Sunday for me. I'm not sitting here saying, let's do this together because what could be more uncomfortable than to talk about circumcision? If you don't know what circumcision is, you should talk to your parents because I'm not about to go that route with you, okay? I'm not trying to go that route, but here's, here's what, in reality, one of my obligations as a pastor has never been to only say what you want me to say to you, but it's been, it's been willing to commit to saying what God's word says to all of us and the truth of that. And so... Yeah, you're clapping, but let's have another fun Sunday talking about circumcision, okay? Everybody's like, oh, I clapped too soon. I shouldn't have got excited about that. Paul said it's for freedom that Jesus has set you free. And then he said this, and it gets a little bit challenging right here. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, look what he says, Christ, that's Jesus. Jesus will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. And people in the room are like, well, I don't have a problem with that. That's not really what I'm wrestling with. Right. But back in that day, it was trust Jesus and be circumcised to experience freedom. And Paul is saying, the moment you add anything to the finished and complete work of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection is the moment you devalue every ounce of what he has done, not because it wasn't finished and complete, but because we simply are adding religiosity back into it. And the moment we add any weight and burden to the freedom that we were intended to find from Jesus is the moment we create a mess not a relationship with a holy God that frees us to live the purpose we were made to know. I do live in freedom. Then can you walk away from what once was? Can you let go of that shame? Can you, can you turn away from those labels and identifiers that have far too long ascribed our worth and value and step into a belief that God is everything you or I might need to be satisfied deep in our soul, grace for the now place? Because Paul's saying the moment you go back to the law, the moment you go back to performance, the moment you go back to rules, the moment you go back to a scorecard that in your mind helps you feel like God loves you more than other people because of what you're doing and how you're earning it is the moment you don't find freedom. It's the moment you create religion and religion often produces a mess. Jesus didn't die to create a mess. Jesus died that you might know his heart and that he might call you and I friend. Paul continues what he's saying here to, to make a, a really strong picture. If you're gonna follow Jesus, then you need to be able to perform and keep up with the whole law. Travis had a great message last week recognizing none of us could meet that standard. That's why we needed a savior. And so Paul continues, you are severed. Look at his language. Anybody going back, anybody performing, anybody trying to add to, you are severed from Jesus. You who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. 
In other words, if you're gonna go back to performing, you better perform in perfection to earn God's standing. Problem? Yes, none of us can meet that performance level. All of us are broken. All of us uh, feeling the effects of sin. All of us have fallen short of the standard that God set for us. That's why to try to go back to that, to earn right standing or righteousness with God will never offer us the freedom that Jesus intended for us because it was never supposed to. But if we keep going back, we might as well cut ourselves off for freedom in Jesus because we're running back to a system of performance. Now, I'm not suggesting what God is calling us into is perfection. Jesus never said, I'm gonna die to make them perfect as if that was even possible for us in our broken state. But the goal is becoming more and more like him. The question is simply how we're aiming to do that. Are we trying to do that by going back to who we once were? Or are we trusting him to be enough for us to guide us in who we were made to be. Once you, by grace, through faith, have trusted in the finished work of Jesus's death and resurrection to not only pay the sin debt for your soul and mine, but rising from the grave to forever defeat sin and death for all of life is the moment your soul can take that deep breath of grace. The weight is lifted the, lifted, the performance is over, the shame and condemnation no longer rule me because I am identified as a child of God. And look where I'm standing now. I'm not who I once was. I'm not 100% finished yet, but look who I'm becoming as a son or daughter. But Paul says the moment you go back, you might as well walk away. Jesus isn't of any value to you at that point. Strong, strong words. Because our heart, our call, is that by faith, we walk with the Holy Spirit of God working in us to do in us what we could never do for ourselves. That's grace, guys. That's freedom. That's walking out from under shame and condemnation, law and performance, and accepting that we could never be enough, but we're so deeply loved by God that Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the grave is the enough that we've been searching for. And I love the way Paul began to sum it up by saying it this way. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. I wish the Galatians were struggling with literally everything, anything else, because I think it would change the value of this verse. But, but this is Paul's thesis. This is his whole point. And I, I think for us, because this, the Jewish culture of Paul's day feels so different from the culture of our day, that, that the power of what Paul is saying is lost on us. So let me read it to you in a different way. I'm reading to you currently from the English Standard Version. When I'm reading by myself to get to know God better, I often read from the New Living Translation, the NLT. Let me read the second half of this verse in the NLT because I think it sums up exactly the heart of what Paul was getting at, and it's this. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. Paul, Paul's saying, if you're a regular church attender or not, if you're trying to follow Jesus or not, if you're trying to experience his grace or not, if you're perfect or not, it, what, the, the point of all of this, what we're aiming at, what we're living to know, what we're dying to experience is this, the importance of all that we do and all that we are as a church is our faith in God as it's expressed in love. Love for God and love for others. So remember the question I started with? How do you know? How do I know if we're really living in the grace and freedom of Jesus? Paul begins to answer that question by saying, well, does your faith move you toward love? And, and here's a part, if I could, if I could pause for a minute, minute to, to make sure everybody's on the same page. Paul was trying to say exactly this to the church in Galatia, and I think it's going to matter for you and I today. Here's how he started it. For freedom, Christ has set us free. 
You, you were made to be free. Your soul was made to be free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Why? Because what is important is faith expressing itself in love. Our souls were made to be free in order that we might love. You see, that there's something incredibly beautiful about the nature of the freedom Jesus died that we might know. Can I leave you with this thought? The freedom, is, uh, the freedom of Jesus is both a freedom from and a freedom to. Let me explain. It, it is a beautiful thing, and it is the deep breath that many of the folks tuning in or regularly attending Bridgepoint need in their hearts to know that Jesus has freed us from the sin of our past from the weight that's entangled us, from the shame we've uh, accrued, from the, the things that have trapped us and identified us and defined us for far too long. And praise God that his shed blood covers the weight of that sin, that we're no longer identified by who we once were, but instead we're identified as a son or daughter of God. But here's where things often get wrong for you and I living in our culture is that we often feel like freedom from is the point. Here's what I mean. I love that you and I get to live in these great United States of America. And while she's not perfect, there's no other nation I'd rather live in because it's all about freedom and it always has been that. No taxation without representation, dump the tea in the harbor. We're free from that kind of rule and regulation. That's not what is, that's not what is going to define us. But what that has become, especially in our modern culture, is to take the concept of freedom from and imply it that I am totally free. So don't tell me how to live my life. You do you and I'm gonna worry about me. That might work for you, but it doesn't have to work for me. And that could be your truth, but it doesn't have to be mine. Why? Because I'm free. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody tells me how to live. Nobody tells me who I have to be. I get to choose that because I'm free. That's the cultural freedom of the normative experience of what people think of in freedom all around us. And yes, Jesus freed us from our past, but to leave us in a place where we're just free from sin leaves us with the temptation to want to use that freedom to serve our selves. And many of us in service to self want to believe that we're free, but are actually ultimately living to serve ourselves, to impress others, to meet the expectation, to make the money, to have the retirement home and, and to have a nice retirement coming to have the perfect relationship or the perfect kids or the perfect life by someone else's standards. And we put all these perfect things that we're striving for that suddenly we're not walking in freedom. We're chained to an expectation that God never placed on our lives. And the beauty of Jesus is he said, you're free from all of this so that you get to be free to love. Because it's in how we love others that we discover who we were made to be. You see, when you and I get the freedom to choose love, that it's no longer wild to us that we would spend ourselves loving unlovable people because we get to. It's no longer weird to us that we would choose to love people that are talking about us behind our backs because we can. It's no longer unusual to us that we could choose love for people that don't love us in response because we get to. Because none of those things define who we are. Our definition and value was settled on a cross 2,000 years ago and the life offered for us rose from the grave so that death and sin no longer defines us anymore. We get to love like we've been loved. Here's what I mean. This is what Paul said as he was developing this thought. Verse 13, you were called to freedom, brothers. Don't forget it. Only 
do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Because the moment we say, I'm free, so get out of my way. I'm free, you're not. I'm free, praise God, I don't live like you, I don't struggle like you do, I don't have your sin problems and your struggles because I'm a free individual is the moment that our pride is causing us to get chained up to an ego that will not allow us to live free. Jesus certainly freed us from sin, but he freed us to love because absent of love, we get really good at loving ourselves and serving the flesh. And Paul contrasts living by the flesh versus living by the spirit. Verse 14, the whole law, everything we once knew as good Jews, Paul was saying, is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was asked by a lawyer, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love God with everything you've got. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor like yourself. The point of our freedom wasn't to put ourselves on the pedestal so we could be like, free. The point of our freedom was to bow the knee in service to others that desperately need to know the love of God like we do. Paul continues, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You see the tension? When we choose to live our freedom as in service of ourselves, life to the flesh, we're missing out on the purpose and the beauty of the life God intended for us. But when we'll work to live by God's way and for God's purposes, we get to experience a, a purpose so much greater than what we could ask or imagine for ourselves. That's why we aim to live by the Spirit, to get to know Him and to walk in step with Him, to learn to hear His voice as we read God's Word and understand what He's speaking to us and to live according to His plan that produces love for God and love for others in and through us. Otherwise, we're living for our own ego. And that's not freedom. That's exhausting. And many of us are tuning into this message today knowing exactly the weight of exhaustion I'm talking about. Because you do feel stuck. You do feel trapped. You do feel like you're, you're lacking if you're not in a relationship. Lacking if you don't have that thing for comfort. Lacking if you don't have the status or the likes. Lacking if you don't measure up or meet the expectation. Is that really freedom? Because it doesn't, be, doesn't seem to be what the Spirit desired for us. That's why Paul said, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So to follow Jesus and follow his lead means it's not about our performance. In fact, we get to boast in the fact that we are too weak to meet that standard because it's in our weakness that he is strongest. I can't, but he can. I'm not able, but he sure is. So my life, I get to trust into his hands and live to make sure other people know the joy and freedom that I found in surrender, not in control. Paul was helping people break it down. But as a side note, I want you to know that that's why Bridgepoint Church's mission is to help people, all people get closer to God by believing in Jesus, living his teachings and becoming his people. Because we believe the closer you get to know about God, the more you get to know him and in knowing him, the more you can trust him and the more you can trust him, the more you can surrender to him. And when you surrender, that's when we really come alive. And that's the beauty of what God is calling us into. In fact, he tried to make it really, really clear to, to be able to tell the difference between the two. Here's what I mean by that. Paul said the works of the flesh, when we're not living by the Spirit, what we produce, what our ego can often uh, effort for us is sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. 
Was Paul writing this about our culture or his? Or is it the reality that when we don't live by the Spirit, it produces the same fruit as if as any culture would? He continues saying envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Paul said, I warn you, as I've warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, Paul's not saying if you're not perfect, you're going to miss out on God's kingdom. Trust in Jesus by grace through faith as his ultimate sacrifice is the key to rescuing our souls. But what Paul is saying is if this is the common fruit of your life, then it's worth questioning if you're really free or if you're still guided and chained, trapped by sin. Because Paul said, that doesn't look like freedom to me. In fact, Paul contrasted it with this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Walking closer and closer to God every day produces love. It causes us to love. It frees us to love. And many theologians even believe that love is the fruit and everything from that point forward is just unpacking what love looks like. Paul's saying the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Paul says, against such things, there is no law. Why? Because that's what it looks like to live in freedom, where you got nothing to prove and nothing to lose and everybody to love. But does this look like our culture? Or does the other list look more like our culture? Because here's the moment we so often get it wrong. The first step is the moment we begin to lose our self-control because then our lives become about preference, ego, our own desires, getting our own way, making our own voice heard. And when we start to lose our self-control, it's really gonna work against our ability to be gentle with others because we're really just trying to win at that point. And when we lack gentleness, it's going to be hard to be faithfully showing up for God or for others because we got an ego that we need to show up for. And when we lack faithfulness, it's not going to produce a lot that's good. And when we're not producing much goodness, you can sure believe it that it's not going to look very kind. And when we lack kindness, then get in front of me at the wrong line at the grocery store at the stoplight and see how much patience I can demonstrate. And when I'm lacking patience, my world becomes anything but peaceful. And when I lack peace, you don't find much joy. And anybody that's walking without joy is certainly not going to have deep roots in love. But Paul said, but Paul said, all that's just an indicator that you're not standing firm in freedom. But instead, there's an ounce of who you are, of your ego, of your past, of your personality, or or of expectations you and I have taken on or placed upon ourselves that are rooted in, as Paul would call it, the flesh or things of this world. Because Paul said, if we'll make it our pursuit to get to know God, and get closer to him, then what begins to happen to us is being led by the Spirit, and we produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Why? Because we're walking in freedom, and there's no law for that. Like how Paul wrapped up this chapter as he's beginning to wrap up his entire letter. But but just contrasting the lists, which one sounds more like what our culture desperately needs? And I really hope your answer is to be led by the Spirit. Because I think that's why Paul wrapped it up by saying, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Because our world doesn't need more division and dissension, ego and pride. Our world doesn't need more opinion. Our world doesn't need more control. Our world needs more love. And followers of of Jesus have that opportunity to say, I lay down my passions and desires so that I can take up Jesus and live a life that's guided by his spirit living through me. 
Because the freedom of Jesus is certainly a freedom from, but the depth of beauty of the freedom of Jesus is that it's both a freedom from and a freedom to. Love the unlovable. Love my neighbor. To, to do for one what I wish I could do for many. To do more for one than what he expected me to do. To love people that otherwise you'd have no business loving. Why? Because I can live with nothing to prove and nothing to lose. How? How do you ever get to a space? How do you know you're living in the grace and freedom of Jesus? When you understand what's most important. Faith expressing itself in love. How do you know if you're fully living into that? Look at the relationships around you as I look at mine. And what I hope is my response, and maybe it needs to be yours too, is God, would you give me more grace for this now place that I could be free to love as you have loved me. And in so doing, paint a picture to the world of what true freedom really looks like. Would you pray with me? God, may that be the heart as we process the weight of Paul's words and, and understand deeper this message. God, it seems like our world's doing a just fine job of aiming to satisfy its own desires. God, our, our culture feels tense. Po politics so divided. Culture has so much opinion, so many labels, so many burdens it feels like we should bear, so much weight that it feels impossible to carry, and maybe because it is. And God, the reality of what you're trying to do has never been anything that could be contained in inside any law. Because God, your desire for us has been freedom. Freedom from shame and condemnation. Freedom from expectations and performance. Freedom from relationships and things and places. Opinions and power. God, free not only to be free from that, but free to love. May it be true of us as a church because it becomes true of us as individuals. And God, as we do it, May it turn our world upside down with what freedom in Jesus really looks like. Thank you, Jesus, that you've bought our freedom. It's in your name we pray, amen. So can I ask you something? Are you really free? Like really free? Free to love? free to be who God made you to be, free to drop the labels, weights, pressures, and expectations of this world so that we could simply live as dearly and deeply loved children of God, free to live in freedom and use it as a way to love other people. Are you really free? Because my fear is that many of us want to say that we are, but are then are gonna turn around and head back to work to perform head back to a relationship to find validation, head back to things or statuses or ideas in our mind that will make us feel like we're enough. And that's not freedom when Jesus has already said, you're enough, not in your performance or mine, but in his. Maybe today needs, the beginning to, to, needs to be the beginning of a step towards relationship with an almighty God whose Holy Spirit is here now speaking to you and me. And if that's you, I want you to know that there's a prayer and care team available to walk with you online. You simply click a link in the room, out the doors to the right or balcony to the right and down the stairs. And there are people that would love to introduce you to Jesus and the beauty of his grace and love that could free your soul from the weight, shame and condemnation that it's been carrying. But maybe there's also believers in the room that need to take a moment and reevaluate because we would have said that we were free. But does freedom look like what we've been running back to, to define us, to validate us, or to make us feel loved? 
My friends, it's for freedom that you've been set free. And I hope now that there's a moment of joy, delight in all that God has done by sending his son to die in my place and yours and his rising from the grave that sets us free, that we can say, thank you, God. Look where I'm standing now by grace, through faith in the risen son and his name is Jesus. So the invitation today is simply to do business with him. Would you stand and do that as we sing and respond? together.
Amen. Church, amen. Come on. Hey, I'm challenged and walking away with that word that Tyler shared today. If God didn't just save us from something, but he saved us to something. So I hope you carry that with you throughout this week. Hey, just a few things to share with you before you are dismissed. You hopefully saw it on your way in before you sat down. There is an impact card um, on your seat or around you on one of these seats. And essentially what that is, are there's different categories where we're asking you, hey, will you serve in one of these areas of need during Christmas Eve? And so we have multiple Christmas Eve services and we're in need of volunteers to really put on an awesome Christmas Eve experience and time for our people and for our church. And so the ask is, hey, would you take that card with you, fill it out on your way out of church um, this morning, and then drop it off with us at one of the info counters. And if you can't answer right now, take that card home with you, fill it out, and then bring it by the church at some point. We'd love to connect it connect with you and we'll follow up with you. And even if you're saying, Gabe, I'm not qualified, hey, we'll train you in the areas uh, that we're in need of and we would love to walk alongside you in that. As well, young adults, we have something for you this week happening. So if you find yourself in that 18 to 30 range, we have a young adults hang here at the Tyrone campus. Essentially what it is, it's a young adults hang. So we're gonna hang out together, build some community, build relationships. So we'll have food, we'll have a bonfire going and it's just a really Really awesome time to connect with other young adults across Bridgepoint Church. So hope you'll join us for that. That's on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. here at the Thai Roan campus. As well, we have Vision Night. So you've heard us talking about it the last couple of weeks. And so, look, Bridgepoint has an incredible history. God has done incredible things. And so we're going to reflect about that. But more importantly, what I'm most excited about is we're gonna talk about where God is taking us and where God is leading us in the future as a church. So join us for that. We're gonna worship together. Childcare will be available and provided. And so that's happening November 7th here at the Tyrone campus at 6.30. So that's a Monday. So mark that on your calendars and join us for that. Friends, we talk about it every single week and we really do mean it, but our goal and our mission, what God has uh, planted here at Bridgepoint Church is helping people, all people get closer to God. And so that's all that we do. Everything that we do goes towards that mission. And so your tithes and your offerings, it helps in that. And I hope that you can see the different areas, the different ways um, that we're reaching the community. Your tithes and your offerings help with that. So if you've come prepared to give today, you can do that here in the room, online through the app or outside in the atrium. If you have any questions, of course, please don't hesitate to ask. Friends, Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We love you, church. We'll see you next Sunday. Go in peace.